Tonight on Y News, Vice President Lenny Robredo says majority of the illegal drugs shipped in the country come from China. But PDA Chief Aaron Aquino refutes the Vice President's statement. Manila Mayor Isco Moreno meets with Moro National Liberation Front Chairman Nur Miswari. The Sandigan Bayan has found former Isabella Governor Grace Padaca guilty of charges of graft and malversation in connection to her involvement in the alleged misuse of agricultural funds in 2006. A legal expert says China's 40% ownership of the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines, or NGCP, is deemed legal under the Constitution. And the Department of Health confirms first case of vape-associated lung injury in Western Visayas. Good evening. Vice President Lenny Robredo will further study information on the supply of illegal drugs that enter the country. This after the meeting with ICAD's enforcement cluster yesterday. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. Vice President Lenny Robredo believes most of the illegal drugs that enter the Philippines come from China. The Vice President wants to get more data and study the information gathered regarding the matter. Tapos kasi yung pinaka-report talaga sa atin ngayon, karamihan sa supply na pumapasok dito galing China. Pati yung mga nakukulin na mga nag operate within the Philippines, karamihan Chinese nationals or Filipino-Chinese nationals. But according to Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency Chief Aaron Aquino, illicit drugs smuggled into the country originate from the Golden Triangle Drug Syndicate. According to Aquino, due to China's crackdown on illegal drugs, instead of manufacturing, the syndicate outsources supplies from other areas. Authorities say the Golden Triangle is within the region of the border of Thailand, Myanmar, and Laos. The illegal drug supply reduction is among Senator Panfilo Lacson's recommendations when she accepted the appointment as co-chairperson of the Interagency Committee on Anti-Illegal Drugs or ICAD. For now, the Vice President is tasking enforcement agencies to provide her with a list of equipment to gauge the capacity and capability of enforcement agencies in stopping the entry of illegal drugs in the country. So, ang suggestion ko, magkaroon ng separate na presentation from ICAD nung lahat na kailangan na capabilities para maggampanan ng bawat agency yung dapat niyang gampanan. The Vice President also plans on discussing the drug war with other countries, including the United States, as part of the move to further intensify the Philippine government's anti-illegal drugs campaign. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, Caloacan City. For the first time, Moro National Liberation Front Chairman Norm Iswari met Manila Mayor Isko Moreno today. Among the agenda is the peace process and the shift to federalism. Mayor Isko also presented his gift for the Muslim community. Bernard Dadis has more details. A cemetery dedicated for the Muslim community is the surprise gift presented by Manila Mayor Isko Moreno Dumagoso to Moro National Liberation Front Chairman Nur Miswari as they met this afternoon at the Manila City Hall. The cemetery will be built in Manila, funded by the city government. It is expected to be finished next year. Ms. Warwick congratulated Moreno for winning the mayoralty race. And that is uh, a spectacular you know, political development sa atin. It's difficult to topple a former president. <laughs> Ms. Warwick and the Bagoso also discussed how they have contact with founding chairman Joma Sison. The Bagoso said he was one of the observer in the previous peace talks of the Philippine government to season-led communist group in the Netherlands. I met with the president just the other night. We are not changing our role. And instead of war maker, war maker, peace maker, but the Joma is far behind. Hindi na papalita kanilang isipan. It's not like that. Ms. Wari said the main reason for his visit to the city mayor is the peace process and the proposed shifting of the form of government to federalism as what President Rodrigo Duterte proposed. But during the conversation of the two, Ms. Wari noticed the cameraman documenting the meeting and... 
Sinabi ko kay General Barbes, try to find out. Uh, ano ba yung mga media? Hindi ba? Mga po na... Asa inyo? Walang sa media, no? Top secret. Yes. Bernard Daddy's UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The Armed Forces of the Philippines will continue to strengthen their coordination with the Armed Forces of Indonesia and Malaysia. This is through the Indomal Fee or Indonesia, Malaysia and Philippines Trilateral Cooperative Agreement. Dante Amento tells us why. One of the threats the Philippines is facing is the entry of foreign terrorists through back doors in the southern part of Mindanao. With such threat, the armed forces of the Philippines will continue to strengthen their coordination with neighboring Indonesia and Malaysia through the Indomalfi or Indonesia, Malaysia and Philippines Trilateral Cooperative Agreement, which started in 2017. Based on the agreement, the three countries will work together to secure their common borders. If ever there are reports from, let's say, Indonesia or Malaysia that they are going here, they have to share that information para mapigilan din pagpunta dito. And the same is uh, true also if we have reports that uh, we have uh, uh, fighters that are coming here and, go and going to their respective countries. The armed forces admit because of the Philippine Navy's lack of floating assets, it is inevitable that some foreign terrorists are able to enter the Philippine borders. Foreign terrorists are believed to be responsible in the series of suicide bombing attacks in Sulu and in teaching bomb making to local terrorist groups. Nilang intention bakit sila nandito is uh, para makapag-conduct ng kanilang uh, mga terrorist activities in particular yung uh, pagbobomba. Okay, and uh, hindi natin dapat payagan to because uh, pag uh, na naisagawa nila yung kanilang mga pangarin na ito ay maraming mapipermisyo at ma madadamay sa the three countries have conducted joint maritime exercises to intensify their capabilities against seajacking, piracy, smuggling, and other illegal activities at sea. The AFP have also met with the fishing industry in the Zambasulta area to become force multipliers and help monitor the Philippines' maritime domain. The AFP are expected to send additional assets in the western Mindanao to thwart the entry of foreign terrorists and local terrorist groups like the Abu Sayyaf. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue, Zamboanga City. The Sandigan Bayan 3rd Division has found former Isabella Governor Grace Padaka guilty of graft and malversation in connection with her involvement in the alleged misuse of some 25 million in agricultural funds in 2006. In a decision rendered in open court, the Sandigan, the Sandigan Bayan found Padaka guilty and sentenced her to up to 14 years for the graft charge and up to 10 years for the malversation charge. For now, the anti-graft court allowed her to pay 140,000 pesos for her provisional liberty, which is double the existing bail bond she posted when the charges were initially filed. After the promulgation, Padaka and her lawyer, Rogelio Binluan, revealed that they will appeal the, the conviction and file a motion for reconsideration. The case stemmed from Padaka giving undue advantage to Edwin, Edwin Elfi, a government organization tapped to manage a credit facility for Isabella's rice farmers under a hybrid seed distribution program. As part of the program, the NGO received 25 million pesos, which was part of a loan drawn by the provincial government from the Development Bank of the Philippines. In addition to being a former governor, Padaka was also a Ramon Magsaysay Award recipient. China's ownership of the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines, or NGCP, has made headlines once again due to alleged threat to national security. But according to a legal expert, foreign ownership is allowed in the Constitution. Harleen Delgado tells us why. Concerns over China's 40% ownership of the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines, or NGCP, have once again floated. 
According to some senators, this poses a threat to national security as it may give China the control over the NGCP lines that are responsible for the transmission of electricity across the country. But according to attorney George Irwin Garcia, pamantasan ng lungsod ng Maynila's College of Law Dean, foreign ownership is allowed in the Philippine Constitution. According to Article 12 of the Constitution, the state can enter into ventures with corporations or associations with at least 60 percent of its capital owned by a Filipino. The State Grid Corporation of China owns 40 percent of the NGCP stake. So there is nothing illegal, there is nothing unconstitutional. It's a 40 percent Chinese ownership of the National Grid Corporation. But Garcia adds, in terms of security, the NGCP must ensure that Chinese have no control over its facilities. It is also stated in the Constitution that the participation of foreign investors is limited to its share in the corporation's capital, while the executive and managing officials should be comprised of Filipinos. Dapat siguro duhin nila 60-40 ang arrangement. 40% nga Chinese, baka naman yung 60 mga nasa likod Chinese din. Baka naman yung 60, baka naman sila ay naka-front lang for the Chinese. O baka naman sila ay tinatawag natin dummies for the Chinese. Huwag naman sana mangyari yun. Senate Committee on Energy Chair Senator Sherman Gachalian has earlier said that Chinese can give technical assistance but only the Filipinos can manage the transmission lines. In 2017, 26 NGCP engineers and technical staff were sent to China for training in preparation for the corporation's big projects. In 2015, the Department of Energy announced it would not renew the working visas of the 18 Chinese experts said to be working in the NGCP. To allay fears, the NGCP has earlier said this only means business. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue Manila. A Filipino economist says the official development assistance of various countries for the Philippines under the Duterte administration is gradually being fulfilled. Rosalie Coz reports. The Duterte administration has spent about 1 trillion pesos for its infrastructure projects from 2016 to 2018. The government's Build, Build, Build Golden Infrastructure Program is estimated to be worth a total of 8 trillion pesos. According to a Project Facilitation, Monitoring and Innovation Task Force report, as of July 31, 2019, the priority projects implemented through official development assistance loans and grants has amounted to 2.01 trillion pesos through partners and international institutions such as Japan, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, South Korea, China, the United States of America, and others. Some of the infrastructure flagship projects that have already begun under the China grant are the Binondo Intramuros Bridge, Australia Pantaleon Bridge, and the Chico River Pump Irrigation Project. According to Filipino economist Michael Ricafort, the pledges, loans, and grants to the Philippines under the Duterte administration are now gradually being implemented, especially that the deals are between two governments and considered close to binding. So, mas mabilis supposedly pagka yung, yung mga true, yung mga ODAS or yung uh, true assistance by the other countries. Yung tinatawag na official development assistance. So, una, mas mabilis yun. The Economist also points out President Rodrigo Duterte's recurrent visits to some countries are to enhance bilateral economic and tourism relations and to ensure the welfare of overseas Filipino workers. President Duterte has gone to China five times and to Japan four times. He is set to visit South Korea for the second time this month. The Republic of Korea is also an ODA or official development assistance country and one of the Philippines' trading partners. Pansin ninyo, balik-balik yung presidente at yung administration kung saan malaki yung bilateral trade. Kung baka, ano, marami tayong transaksyon o export sa kanila, nag-host sila ng OFWs na medyo madami. Kung di marami silang binibigay na grant na yung mga infrastructure, pati sa ibang funding na rin. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. A collaboration of 31 artists features various works of art in an exhibit happening tonight 
and on Sunday night in Marikina City. My Bermudez is in Marikina Riverbank, so tell us why live. Yes, my, go ahead. Good evening, Jago. It's going to be a great weekend for art enthusiasts here at the boiler in Marikina Riverbanks. Dubbed as Foreign Ex Familiar, this art exhibit features paintings, sculptures, art installations, and video designs from 31 contemporary Filipino artists and theater practitioners. The concept of the exhibit revolves around the idea that what appears to be foreign evokes an eerie sense of familiarity, while the utterly familiar can be so strange and so distant. Tonight, Filipino artists presented a unique perspective of the human culture and society. This event is organized by KDR Productions as they push for the advocacy of helping local Filipino artists in their passion and prove they can break boundaries in the international scene. This is an initiative of Kuya Daniel Rezon, a photographer, art enthusiast, and innovator on the Wish 1075 bus, which features local Filipino artists who have the potential to dominate the international music scene. The organizers say the art pieces here challenge the notion of values and ideals. So spend a worthwhile weekend here at the Boiler in Riverbanks here in Marikina. Admission is for free. Jago. Thank you, my Bermudas, reporting live from Marikina's city. Welcome back to Y News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I'm Alex Baltazar, and here are the headlines. Abulog Cagayan residents fear possible recurrence of flash floods due to tropical storm Ramon. Pasig River Rehabilitation Body respects President Rodrigo Duterte's order of disestablishment. Department of Environment and Natural Resources hire 4,000 residents for the Manila Bay Rehabilitation. Despite the African swine fever crisis, prices of ham in market increase. And the Department of Health confirms first case of vape-associated lung injury in Western Visayas. Good evening. Abulog Cagayan residents fear the possible recurrence of flash flood due to tropical storm Ramon. Authorities warn Abulog residents must cooperate when a forced evacuation is called for. From Tuguegarao City, Joe Wanano tells us why live. Joanne, good evening. Yes, good evening, Alex. Several residents in Abulog Town, Cagayan Province, uh, fear of possible recurrence of flash floods as Tropical Storm Ramon is set to make landfall this weekend. Based on Pagasa's forecast, Tropical Storm Ramon will bring heavy rainfall over Cagayan and Isabela provinces. As Tropical Depression Kiel left for casualties and washed out around 50 houses in the town of Abulub, residents are anticipating possible flash floods that threaten to destroy their houses. Talagang takot na takot kami na ano, kawawa yung may mga may bah bahay, kawawa kasi nakikita namin na palubog na palubog sila. Sabi nila may bagyo kaya kami natatakot na naman. Hindi namin alam kung ano yung may experience namin na... Ay, ewan din na. Hindi kasi kami natutulog eh. Kasi dito talaga, pag dumaan ang bagyo, talagang lumalaki po itong dagat na ito. Nilalamon talaga dito sa... Ang hirap lumikas po kasi hindi mo naman basta-basta maiwan ang bahay. Mga ano. Kaya maasa na lang kami kung ano na sana hindi ganun, ganun kagrabe ang ano, darating na bagyo. Families who have lost their houses remain in evacuation centers. They appeal to the government to help them rebuild their houses. What they are asking for are financial assistance or construction materials. Meanwhile, the chairman of Barangay Danaili, Abulog Cagayan, advises his constituents not to return to their houses yet to avoid any accidents as the typhoon nears. Sinapihan ko mga kabarangay ko na itong danger zone nito na nangyari na ano, nawas out, eh wala na silang, hindi na silang pwedeng tumira. Kasi mahirap na yung may mangyari na naman uli na gano'n na ano, 
the Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office is on red alert in preparation for the possible effects of Tropical Storm Ramon. The repacking of relief items is ongoing. All of the rescue units are on standby in seven strategic areas. The towns of Tuwau, Tugigaraw, Igig, Lalo, Gonzaga, Apari, and Sanchez Mira. The PDRRMO has alerted all local chief executives in the province and ordered municipal disaster risk reduction and management offices to immediately evacuate residents once the situation worsens. The PDRRMO is appealing for the cooperation from the residents in case a forced evacuation is called for. Kasi yung nangyari yan sa amin eh, saka naabotan kami ng dilim nang dahil sa katigasan ng ulo nila. So sana hindi na mangyari uli yun para safe lahat. Alex, although the authorities are prepared, the PDRRMC admits they still fear the possibly huge impact of Tropical Storm Ramon as several residents are yet to recover from the previous calamity. And that is the latest live here in Tugegarao, Cagayan. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Joe Anano reporting live from Tugegarao City. Tropical storm Ramon slightly weakens while remaining almost stationary. As of 5 p.m. today, its center was located at 460 kilometers east of Togegarao City, Cagayan, packing maximum sustained winds of 65 kilometers per hour and gustiness of up to 80 kilometers per hour. It is almost stationary but forecast to make landfall in Cagayan by Sunday or Monday morning. Tropical cyclone wind signal number one is raised over the eastern portion of Cagayan, particularly Sunday. Santa Ana, Gonzaga, Lalo, Gataran, Bagao, and Peña Blanca. Eastern portion of Isabela, particularly Maconacon, Divilacan, Palanan, and Dinapique. And northern Aurora, particularly Dilasa, Kasiguran, and Dinalungan. Tomorrow, light to moderate with intermittent heavy rains may be experienced over the eastern portions of Cagayan and Isabela and northern Aurora. On Sunday, light to moderate with occasional heavy rains may be experienced over the eastern portions of Cagayan and Isabela. Light to moderate with intermittent heavy rains over Apayao, northern Aurora, and the rest of Isabela and Cagayan. Residents in the aforementioned areas, especially those living in the areas identified to be highly or very highly susceptible to flooding and rain-induced landslides, are advised to take precautionary measures. The Pasig River Rehabilitation Commission says it will abide by President Rodrigo Duterte's order of this establishment. The DNR will be in charge of enforcing laws relevant to the rehabilitation of the Pasig River. Rosalie Cos details why. President Rodrigo Duterte officially ordered the disestablishment of the Pasig River Rehabilitation Commission or PRRC through Executive Order 93. Prior to the release of the EO, the authorities previously held by PRRC were already transferred to the Department of Environment and Natural Resources or DENR and the Manila Bay Task Force. DENR will be in charge of enforcing laws relevant to the rehabilitation of the Pasig River while the Manila Bay Task Force is mandated to harness the Pasig River's potential for transportation, recreation and tourism. Duterte first brought up the idea of dissolving the PRRC in September, saying the river is uncleanable. In response, the PRRC management said it respects the president's decision and vows to abide by the order immediately and to cooperate with concerned agencies for the proper turnover of functions, assets, liabilities, and obligations in relation to its operations. PRRC was established in 1999 under then-President Joseph Estrada for the purpose of rehabilitating Pasig River that connects Laguna de Bay and the Manila Bay and traverses Metro Manila. It was hounded with controversy that led to the dismissal of its former head, Jose Antonio Goitia, due to allegations of corruption. Rosa Licoz, UNTV, News and Rescue. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources hires over a thousand Metro Manila residents for the rehabilitation of Manila Bay for the next six weeks. Dubbed as Estero Rangers, they will act as monitoring personnel of the weekly cleanup drive in the waterways across the metro. Asher Kadapan Jr. reports why. 
mass oat-taking and deployment of about 1,100 individuals hired for the Estero or Waterways Rehabilitation was conducted in Quezon City today. According to Secretary Roy Simatu of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DENR, about 65,000 families reside along the more than 200 waterways across Metro Manila. Water and solid waste are thrown away into the esteros and flow towards Manila Bay, contaminating its water. Gusto namin mismo doon sa lugar na pinagtataponan meron tayong pinya doon. Kayo yung napili. Kayo ang nag-renekomenda ng inyong local government unit, especially your barangay. Two residents for every concerned barangay were assigned as estero rangers effective for the next six weeks. Gusto namin talagang makatulong dahil nga talagang sobrang dumi na talaga. Personal kung nakikita ko, ang mga residente talaga kulang talaga sa disiplina. The project is still part of the Manila Bay rehabilitation through the joint efforts of the government and the private sector in accordance with President Rodrigo Duterte's administrative order. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. A consumer group calls on the government to push for Africans' wine fever or ASF-free pork products. Meanwhile, some customers still patronize ham despite a price hike and the ASF issue. My Bermudez will tell us why. In this ham store in Quiapo, Manila, which is popular among many customers, the prices of products have increased by 40 pesos per kilogram. There are also price adjustments depending on the class of ham. Esther De La Rosa traveled from Angon Rizal all the way to Quiapo. She bought ham despite the African swine fever issue saying she is not affected. Kasi hindi naman affected sa tao. Tao pa nga nakakawa sa baboy. Scrapped and pineapple ham are some of the target purchases of this customer. Kasi masarap din naman siya. Meanwhile, Laban Consumer says the government should ensure that local pork products are safe from ASF instead of just saying it's not harmful to humans. Consumers should not remain complacent even when buying from their trusted pork product manufacturers. Hindi ka rin makasigura eh because you don't make any is a trusted company. I mean, pero nasigitan sila. In other words, you cannot be sure eh kasi yung sources mo ng baboy, hindi mo alam kung may ASF eh. Farm gate price of pork is 80 pesos to 85 pesos per kilogram. My Bermudez, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The National Capital Region Police Office will raise their alert status to full alert as part of the security preparations for the upcoming Southeast Asian Games. And CRPO Acting Director Police Brigadier General Debold Sinas says they will deploy plain-clothed policemen in debilitating areas and in the venues of the Games. Playa Ilagan will tell us why. It's all systems go for the National Capital Region Police Office, or NCRPO, for the security of the Southeast Asia North Sea Games. NCRPO Acting Director, Police Brigadier General Debold Sina says he will deploy 8,000 policemen in 27 billeting areas and 19 venues with 24 sports activities within Metro Manila. The police deployment will start on November 22, while the full alert status will be on November 25 to December 14. 80 policemen in plain clothes and without firearms will be assigned in small billet areas, and 160 PNP personnel for big billeting areas. Nilimi talaga yung mga mga long firearms natin para puro police lang talaga ang nakaiyuporni, so puro short firearms lang. So nilimit yung mga long firearms, yung mga fatigue uniform to peripheral para hindi sila maalarma. Sinas maintains they have not received any threats in connected with the SEA Games. We just uh, complied with the directive to secure the venues, the route, and the uh, uh, billet areas. Uh, no threat has been received as of now. General Sinas adds, however, the problem they are faced with is the security escort's real-time communication using two-way radio. 
Martinez reminds the public to avoid bringing water, bladed and pointed weapons, and large bags if they plan on watching the regional sports event. For security purposes, they can use transparent bags instead. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue, Camp Krami. The Department of Health confirmed that it has received an official report on the first case of e-cigarette or vape-associated lung injury from a private pediatric pulmonologist based in the Visayas. Based on the DOH information released to the media, the patient is a 16-year-old female who had been using e-cigarettes for six months while concurrently consuming combustible cigarettes referred to as dual use. It said the patient who was admitted last October 21 initially presented sudden onset of severe shortness of breath which required them to administer her with oxygen and be admitted to the ICU. The report also said the clinical impression was initially considered to be infectious in nature, but after further evaluation, the patient met the case criteria for vape-associated lung injury based on the guidelines of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. The patient, however, was subsequently discharged after receiving appropriate care from the attending pulmonologist, who is now in continuous communication with the DOH regarding the condition of the patient. Health Undersecretary Rolando Enrique Domingo said all e-cigarette users should seek immediate medical help and ask their doctors for ways to quit these harmful products. Welcome back to Wine News. MRT Line 3 passengers express relief now that they won't need to walk up the stairs of Bonnie and Ayala stations, especially the senior citizens. Here's why from Asher Kadapan Jr. Metro Rail Transit Line or MRT3 has announced 34 out of 46 of the train system's escalators are now fully operational. This after its maintenance provider Sumitomo MHITESP repaired two escalator units in Boni Southbound and Ayala stations. Passengers express relief now that they won't have to walk up the stairs in these stations. Salamat at magagamit na. Ilang beses na ako naglalakad sa hagdan. Hindi ako talaga... Nahihirapan talaga kami umakit sa agdan sa panahon ngayon, lalo na ang senior. Hirap na hirap na talaga kami. Uh, mahalaga talaga ang escalator kasi lalo na doon sa mga medyo nahihirapang lumakad, kailangan talaga yung escalator. When the rehabilitation began in October last year, the railway already had 46 escalators across its stations. But only 20 were running, so more than 50% of the escalators were not working. The MRT management anticipates the completion of the repair of the rest of the escalators before the year ends. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. And for the news abroad, here's Stephanie C. reporting live from Hong Kong. Steph, good evening. Good evening, Alex. A strong earthquake hit off the Indonesian coast in the Maluku Sea early this morning, prompting a tsunami warning for nearby areas. The U.S. Geological Survey reported that the magnitude 7.1 quake was centered in the sea about 140 kilometers northwest of Ternate in North Maluku province. Indonesia's Meteorology, Climate and Geophysics Agency said the tsunami warning issued for North Sulawesi and North Maluku was cancelled about two hours after the quake hit. Authorities have called on residents in North Sulawesi and North Maluku to return to their homes. The National Disaster Agency said it was still gathering information on any damage that may have been caused by the earthquake. Hong Kong was hit with another day of turmoil and a second man has died during the protests. Details in this report. A 70-year-old cleaner who is thought to have been hit by a brick during a clash between protesters and pro-Hong Kong government residents died late on Thursday, hospital officials said. His death came less than a week after a student protester who had fallen from a building died from his injuries. Since then, the level of violence at the protests that have began five months has reached new heights. 
During the strike on Monday, a 21-year-old was shot by police and a 57-year-old man doused in flammable liquid and set on fire after arguing with protesters. Hong Kong news outlet South China Morning Post reported on Thursday that embattled leader Carrie Lam met senior officials Wednesday night to discuss whether to postpone the district council elections scheduled for November 24. No official announcement has been made by the authorities regarding this matter. The Hong Kong protests, which have drawn massive crowds since June following a contentious proposed extradition law, have turned into a movement seeking to improve democracy in the city-state and safeguard the region's partial autonomy from Beijing. However, some demonstrators have opted for more radical tactics than peaceful civil disobedience and violent clashes with the police have been frequent. Stephanie C, UNTV News and Rescue. The exceptionally high tides or high waters in Venice are a yearly occurrence that has become part and parcel of the city's character. But in the last few years, the phenomenon has become more frequent and more catastrophic. Jovic Burmas explains why. To date, astronomical factors like the moon dictated the coming and going of the tide around Venice. Meteorological elements like heavy rain and winds across the Adriatic Sea can also play a role. But lately the phenomenon is exaggerated by a combination in Venice's subsiding ground soil and rising sea levels. Extreme weather events such as strong winds that blow the seawater into the city are becoming more frequent. In Venice, when the water level is between 80 and 109 centimeters, there is talk of a sustained tide. When it is between 110 and 139 centimeters, it is considered a very strong tide. And when it reaches 140 centimeters, it is classed as exceptional. By this time, 59% of the city becomes inundated. From 2000 until now, there have been 11 exceptional tides. According to data from the Italian National Institute for Environmental Protection and Research, between 1872 and 2016, the sea level in Venice rose 35 centimeters, about 2.5 millimeters a year. Moreover, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said there could be a global rise in sea levels of about 1.5 meters, which would have catastrophic consequences for the Italian tourist hotspot. Experts attribute the rise in ocean levels to the melting of the glaciers and the Antarctic ice sheet, the largest mass of ice on our planet. Venice's Tide Forecast Center also said that the groundwater under Venice was sinking due to natural and human causes, which is causing a reduction in groundwater. Meanwhile, Italy has declared a state of emergency in Venice. Italy's Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte described the flooding as a blow to the heart of our country. He said the government would now act quickly to provide funds and resources. Jovic Burma, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Stephanie C. reporting live from Hong Kong. It's going to be a deciding game for the two previous UNTV Cup champion teams on Sunday as Judiciary Majors battles PNP responders. Bernard Dadis details why. It's winner stakes all for two-time champion Judy Jerry Magis and season 5 champ PNP responders on Sunday, 4.30 p.m. in Pasig City Sports Center. The Magis and the responders both have won three win-loss records. The winning team between the two will advance to the second round eliminations, while the loser will get eliminated. Despite a poor start, PNP head coach Eric Samson is confident his team can make a huge comeback. Pasok kami sa next round. Yung mga lapses namin, doon kami dapat tumoto, ang dami namin lapses eh. So, aral pa kami kung ano dapat namin pag-aral, especially sa depensa at saka yung opensa namin sa half court. PNP finished fourth place last season while Judy Jerry concluded its season 7 campaign on the 8th spot. 
Meanwhile, the Ombudsman Grabbusters will battle PITC Global Trainers in the first game of the doubleheader at 3 p.m. Defending champion AAP Cavaliers remains on the top spot of Group A, while the DNR Warriors leads Group B with 5 wins and no loss. Bernard Dallis, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Richard Browning, who calls himself the Jet Man, breaks his own record for the fastest flight in a jet suit. Guinness Book of World Records considers Browning an embodiment of the spirit of adventure. Nina Armilio details why. Richard Browning, the founder and chief test pilot of Gravity Industries, flew into the record books once again in Brighton Pier in England on Thursday. This, as he smashed his own record for the fastest speed in a body-controlled jet engine-powered suit while facing his toughest conditions yet. He was more than 50 meters per hour faster than his previous record, hitting an unprecedented speed of 85.06 meters per hour, according to Guinness World Records. We were confident that we should be able to do it, but you can never you know, discount the possibility of having a technical problem. So I'm really very pleased that we've delivered what we've done. And that is indeed the fastest I've ever been in. Browning more than doubled the previous record of 32.02 meters per hour, which he set two years ago. His latest attempt, which saw him fly around 500 meters along the length of the pier, was overseen by Guinness World Records editor-in-chief Craig Landy to verify the result. Richard really embodies the spirit of adventure and everything that we stand for at Guinness World Records. He's always pushing himself to better his achievements. He's inspirational. I think kids all around the world who read about this real life Iron Man, he's like a superhero. And what an ambassador for Guinness World Records Day. The attempt formed part of the Guinness World Records Spirit of Adventure theme, which celebrates adventurers and boundary pushers from around the world. In the UAE, the fastest time to swim 5 kilometers pulling a kayak. In the USA, the longest underhand basketball shot achieved by Dante Hammer Harrison of the Harlem Globetrotters. In France, Mathieu Tordu became the youngest person to reach the South Pole solo 27 years and 40 days. Nina Arnulia, UNTV News and Rescue. A man born with cerebral palsy doesn't let his disability hinder him from reaching his dreams. The Philippine Paralympic team has welcomed him for his abilities. Angela Lagunzat reports why. Joey Eriga de Leon 36 years old, was born with cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a disorder that can cause damage to or prevent proper development of the brain of a child. This can happen during pregnancy or even after birth. Although Joey has a hard time moving, his sickness does not prevent him from achieving his simple dreams in life. Joey is a chess champion in his barangay. He is also a member of the Philippine Paralympic team who competes in Bocha. He was made team captain in 2017. Bocha is a kind of game made for people with cerebral palsy. In time, this became part of the Paralympics and a sport, even for people with problems with their motor skills. Joey doesn't have the ability to speak. And because he can control his hands, he uses his feet to communicate through his cell phone. Ayon, nakikipag-communicate siya through PM, PM lang, chat, text, texting, ko, yung call ako yun eh. Bali ako na lang yung umaalalay sa kanya, siya yung nag-iisip, siya yung kumikilos, ako lang yung kamay niya, ako ang, ako ang katawan niya. Ganun, pero ang sasabihin mo na nagpa-plano, hindi ako yun. This is proof that Joey will do anything to face all the challenges in life in order to succeed. Watch the entire awe-inspiring story of Joey this Saturday, November 16, 5 p.m. on Historia, only on UNTV. Angela Lagunsad, UNTV News and Rescue, Caloocan City. 
those are the reasons behind the news this November 14, 2019. On behalf of Angelo Castro III, I am Alex Baltazar. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. Kasi yung pinaka-report talaga sa atin ngayon, karamihan sa supply na pumapasok dito galing China. Pati yung mga nakuhulin na mga nag operate within the Philippines, karamihan Chinese nationals or Filipino-Chinese nationals. Sinabi po kay General Garbes, try to find out. Uh, ano ba yung mga media? Hindi ba? Mga ano po na... Asa'y yung? Walang sa media, no? Top secret. Yes. So there is nothing illegal, there is nothing unconstitutional. It's a 40% Chinese ownership of the National Grid Corporation. Talagang takot na takot kami na ano, kawawa yung may mga may bahay. Kawawa kasi nakikita namin na palubog na palubog sila. Sinabihan ko mga kabarangay ko na itong danger zone ito na nangyari na ano, na was out. Eh wala na silang, hindi na silang pwedeng tumira kasi mahirap na yung may mangyari na naman ulit.